Hello and welcome to the EDH Retcast, where we're all about commander, data, and dad jokes. I'm Joey Schultz and I'm joined by my fantastic co-hosts. Up first, he can't wait to fall in to fall out, it's Matt Morgan. I feel like lately I'm kind of numb to science puns, they just don't land for me anymore. But when it comes to math puns, I'm even number. Oh man, I, it, you know what, I was an English major, so all of this is lost on me. I don't... <laughs> I'm, well, I'm just glad that this math is adding up for you and the, the jokes check out. Oh, no. I, I, I hope I, you and Dana aren't too divided on how I'm presenting these jokes to you. Listeners, if you can see my face right now, I'm staring daggers. <laughs> All right. Up next, he bought 100 copies of the card Over Encumbered so that he could be Over Encumbered by Over Encumbered. It's Dana Roach. Uh, I was reading a book earlier about like theoretical science fiction concepts, and I got to the chapter on anti-gravity. And I couldn't put it down. It was you couldn't put it down. Yeah, yeah. I, that one, that one, I knew Matt could get me. But Dana, I've got your <laughs> number. All right. Am I math joking correctly, Matt? No, you. I, I, I didn't think I could count on you, and you proved me right. So okay, we're just gonna move on. <laughs> Matt, at the risk of more dad jokes, what is our topic for this week's episode? <laughs> Well, this week we are going to take a foray into pinpoint removal, the targeted removal spells. And I mean, everybody loves a tier list. Everybody loves it when we rate cards. And so we're going to do that this time with removal spells. Yeah, indeed. This is There's a lot of these to get to. So we're going to uh, mm -hmm. find, find some favorites and some not so favorites. Uh, but real quick, we got some shout outs to do before we get into it. Up first, we got to thank Chase, aka Mana Curves, for their terrific work on the post-production of the show. Thank you so much, Mana Curves. You're a great part of the team. And we are also now a proud members of Team Ultimate Guard. So if, if you got to play some games with us at MagicCon Chicago, you got to see some amazing katana sleeves and these nice boulder deck boxes. Their product is excellent. You should check it out. And that's all we're using when we show up at events now. And if you would like to support the show, there are so many ways to do that. There's free ways to do that, like subscribing on YouTube, liking these videos, subscribing to your local podcast apps. It is an easy way to support us, and we appreciate all of that as well. Or if you're so inclined, you can go to patreon.com slash edhretcast, where there's lots of ways just to get yourself a little benefit back in you know, exchange for supporting us on Patreon. So patreon.com slash EDH retcast, where there's all sorts of levels, including the weekly patron shout out that we do every single week, which this week we're going to give over to David Klongland and I mean, Kongland, like King Kong, the, the, the bad movies, hopefully. Well, David, we know you're better than those terrible King Kong movies. So <laughs> thank you for the support. Just, yeah, you're a supporter. You're a patron of ours, which means you're better than all the King Kong movies combined. There, there's like straight up like Cogla, the, the ape, uh, the, the amazing Cogla card is a, a, a strong thing that you're invoking here. Man. But Cogla didn't have a land where King Kong had an eye land. <laughs> oh my lord. Uh, I've lost the thread of this one yet again. And Matt, <laughs> you, you continue to elude me as ever. But yeah, thank you so much, David. It's terrific to, y'all support means the total world. So thank you so much. And uh, now we are going to get into our topic here, talking about, like, where would we rank some of these different uh, pinpoint removal spells? And Matt, you said that uh, and that's an important thing for us to linger on. We're talking about pinpoint removal spells. These are spells that do have to be able to be targeted. We're also, like, talking about cards that can definitely get creatures, especially, not just something that can only get artifacts and enchantments. And to also kind of limit things here, we're also not going to be talking about anything that is itself a creature. And we're also not counting, like counter spells as uh, pinpoint removal spells here either. So that's kind of a lot of stuff, but I think it's important for us to kind of narrow down the focus of what it is that we're actually talking about. And with that, I don't know, where should we get started, do you think? I think the best place to get started will probably be the really obvious and easy things. Uh, although we often will be like, hey, we're just going to talk about this stuff briefly, then move on. We never talk about anything briefly. Um, <laughs> but, but in theory, we will talk about, I would say, Path to Exile and Swords of Paul Shares to start with here. Yeah. Um, it, it, and for me, when I'm evaluating cards like this for a deck, I, I care about how efficient they are. I care about how much utility they offer, and I care about how much consistency they offer. Mm. And the thing with Path and Swords is they, they're they about as good as you can expect on all three of those fronts. Um, you know, they, they exile, so they get on indestructible. That makes it difficult for people to recur them. Um, one mana a piece is really easy to get to, and, and there's not really any caveats on when you can use them. Um, and on top of that, you can occasionally use them to help yourself. 
I've used path before as a ramp effect. I've used sorts of plowshares to save myself um, by gaining life when I would have lost somehow to lethal damage to like a Shiner's Ignition or something. So like they do all of the things. And if I was running any deck running white, both of those are going in it kind of just regardless of the situation. I mean, there's there's a lot of spells. If it's unconditional, cheap and efficient removal, to me at least, that it's really hard to say it's not S tier just because yeah. Yeah. It, yeah, it's unconditional. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we're kind of lingering in the one mana section here. And I'd also kind of personally put Pongify and Rapid Hybridization as S tier as well. Yeah. The one mana ability to pick off a creature. The 3-3 three, three that it leaves behind... I, I don't care. Are these things technically as good as a random path? It d- doesn't matter. And do people want to debate if Swords of Plowshares is better than Path or Path is better than Swords? Does it matter? I'm playing both. Yeah. And if I'm playing yeah. Blue, I'm playing Pongify <laughs> and Rapid Hybridization. That qualifies as a big S tier for me. So yeah, all of those big way to start off with those one mana efficiencies. Yeah, well, and let's get away from one mana because, I mean, those four spells, I think all of us would give S tier too. Mm. But there's some free spells that, that they do have mana cost. But there's a few spells that we, I know all three of us are pretty divided on. So First one, right off the bat, it's free spell-ish. Um, snuff Out. What do you guys think about Snuff Out? Because I, I'm i not super high on it anymore in Commander. I'm not either, to be honest. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, for life is pretty negligible in Commander. Um, if you're playing it, if you, you're controlling a swamp, so like you have that option almost every single time. Um, but non-black creature. Um, yeah. It, it, it is irrelevant enough times that I find it frustrating and there are enough things that I don't find frustrating to make me not want to run it. <laughs> yeah, that, that's kind of it when it comes to removal is that like how many creature removal spells are you actually playing in your deck probably not like 14 of them <laughs> so yeah like at, at a certain point when it comes to like if i label something as c tier that's almost functionally the same as an f tier kind of because I'm, I'm probably not playing either of them but c can be very situational so there are still times where i like some of these uh snuff out i think all of our rankings kind of average out to being like c tier um but matt as long as you're talking about some free removal how do you feel about like Solitude, which is that uh, one that you can evoke, or or Deadly Rollick, which of course can exile a thing and you can play it for free if you have your commander in play. Uh, those ones I think you're a little higher on. So so Deadly Rollick, I actually like a whole lot. I think just being able to play something for free. I mean, we've seen the power of Fierce Guardianship, a free counterspell, or any of the, that whole cycle of spells, really. I really like Dead, Deadly Rollick. Having your commander in play, it's, it's kind of the crux of the format almost. Yeah, I think you put it at A. I've kind of got it at B because there are some commanders where keeping them in play is a little bit harder of an ask. So this isn't like the auto include everyone says it is. But at the same time, I mean, yeah, I like Deadly Raw. Like, especially if I'm playing like a background deck where one of my commanders is an enchantment. That's pretty darn cool <laughs> to just like, all right, play for free kind of anytime. Yeah, it's definitely not an S tier for me. I would probably call it an A. But the, the reason it's not an S tier for me is because there's enough situations where like I, I look at my deck and I'm like, oh, I, I can't count on my commander being in play enough to have this in my deck and I don't want to spend four mana on it. Yeah. Now, there's definitely situations where like, oh, my commander is very cheap. It's not scary enough that folks are going to be using it. It's a perfect include in those decks, but it does. It's not consistently that card. You know, it's not one of those sorts of posture thing. I look at it and I'm like, I'm going to put it in every deck. <laughs> so it, it, this is probably an A and I'm in, in and I'm not even sure I buy that in the decks where I like it. It's amazing, but that's not every deck. Well, and Joey, to answer your question about solitude first. You said we weren't going to talk about creatures, and, and Solitude actually, contrary to popular belief, is a creature. I know nobody's yeah. ever actually <laughs> cast it as a creature or had it on the battleground for long, but uh, it it is pretty much a removal spell. I don't love Solitude very much. I know it is a free removal spell, but also it basically says target creature you are targeting has ward, discard a card. And that's a pretty discouraging ability. Like We talk about how powerful ward is and discarding a card. I don't love it. And so since you have to discard a card in order to get kind of a swords to plowshares type of effect from solitude, I think you're sending yourself back too far for solitude to really be powerful. Modern legacy. Absolutely. It, it, it's a clutch card there, but for commander, I don't think it holds up. Yeah. That, that's so funny. You're right. Cause like in my head, I'm just like, Oh, it's just a free spell. I don't think of it as, but like it is, it is a creature. So like, yeah, it shouldn't be in this list to begin with. All right. We'll, we'll move away from that. <laughs> uh, but I like the discussion on other stuff like the, like the deadly raw. Like, isn't that funny how sometimes cards just occupy a certain spot in your brain and you forget what they actually are. Anyway, <laughs> um, there are other like, 
other cards, especially the one mana spot, like, you know, Defile, Tragic Arrogance, that I think could be interesting to discuss here too. But we already know they're so situational that if you like them, you'll like them. Um, and I think we probably want to talk about more of those, the, the angle that you brought up, Dana, of like the consistency and the ubiquity of some of these things. So I think we'll actually move now to some two mana stuff because there's going to be probably some more juicy discussion here. Um, starting off with a couple of different white spells that can all get rid of stuff that your opponents control, but usually gives them a certain type of reward back. Uh, for example, the new Get Lost can destroy a creature or enchantment or a planeswalker, I believe, but it gives the control of that person, uh, of that card that you got rid of, two map tokens. Or there's Angelic Ascension, which can exile a creature, but it gives them a 4 4 flying angel. Uh, Fateful Absence, unexpectedly absent. There are a couple of these things that have like a situational relationship with getting rid of your opponent's stuff. They're about two mana ish. Where are we falling? So I, I think context really matters in terms of whether or not a lot of these cards are any good the the reality is every white targeted removal spell is at best the third best option yeah, <laughs> yeah. because swords and path exist yeah whereas if you know angelic ascension was a green spell just you know that doesn't make any sense making an angel but like if it was that's a way better card given the competition as opposed to having it in white so that's one of the things you have to think about in terms of like where you're going to rank these. You are looking at whether you're going to run these in the third pinpoint removal spot for white versus a lot of the other colors. And that tends to make it something that you're looking at based on what your deck is going to do. It's like, oh, okay, in this particular deck, this one spell makes sense as my third white pinpoint removal spell. And this other deck this one makes sense. So I think this is where you get to a lot of different flex and it becomes very challenging to, to, to rate these, I think, particularly in the color white. Uh, yeah, like, oh, you're playing Artifacts. Dispatch, we know you're going to play it. It's very yeah. that vibe, but like they're so situational. So yeah, I feel that. Yeah, I, I like Get Lost. Of all the rare removal spells that we've gotten in standard sets the past, for, for a while it seems like, I like Get Lost the most because it's one of the few that isn't either Angelic Ascension, giving your opponents a 4-4 body. That's huge. That is a significant blocker, attacker, anything like that. Right. Fateful Absence, you're basically letting your opponent draw a card. I don't love that either. And so... Same. So Get Lost, to me, is probably, of these that we've mentioned, is probably the only A tier, for, in, in my mind, because two map tokens, you have to pay a mana, and then you get to explore, which, that's not a huge upside. It's not bad, but also that pales in comparison to the other spells and what you end up giving your opponents in return. Yeah, I, I think there's a potential that Get Lost could end up feeling like Faithful Absence because you might let your opponent draw a land. But if you are just like allowing them to pay a mana to put a plus one counter on something, but potentially, like, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of wavering with that one. I'm willing to try it out. And I like the, the flexibility that it offers because it doesn't just hit a creature. It could also get an enchantment, for instance. And that is important to me too. Um, but in general, Dana, I'm totally with you. Uh, a lot of these do feel like... Well, we already know what the top dogs are in this color, so you really have to convince me with a lot of these. Well, to, to move away from white, you have reality shift in blue. Uh, one in the blue to exile target creature, and you manifest a top card of their library. Now, we've already talked about rapid hybridization and Pontify, and how like the two slots in, in blue are kind of already taken up, um, just like it was with white. However, in white, there's like 15 other viable options for that three slot. That's not the case in blue. There's kind of just reality shift, um, at least until Cyber Conversion came out recently. But like, it was pretty much you run those two, and then you also probably run reality shift. It, it, it exiles, which is a pretty big upside. You can mm -hmm. use that manifest ability to mess up somebody's top deck tutor. There, there's a lot of utility hidden in that, and there's not a lot of competitions. Like, I, I love Reality Shift. I would call it an A, and it's bordering on S for me. Same. Again, because of context, because mm -hmm. there's, like, nothing else really in blue competing with it. Well, and I really like Cyber Conversion. It's, get, it, yeah. it's a way to get rid of something, but it's just turning it face down. That is so impactful. I think that that's probably one of the more overlooked removal spells lately just because it's not getting it into a different zone where it can be recurred or anything like that it's turn it face down and it just loses all the abilities there's a lot of value there for only two mana at instant speed yeah you can interrupt combos there there's a lot of flexibility here i like it a lot um 
I think I probably like it just as much as Reality Shift. And Reality Shift has kind of been a staple for a long time. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I think it's just one grade below. Like if I have Reality Shift at A, then this one is going to be a B uh, for a separate conversion. I'm, I'm kind of with you. Uh, unfortunately, I don't feel the same way about Resculpt, uh, which is the blue, kind of the blue Angelic Ascension. <laughs> like Exile, an artifact or a creature and its controller gets a 4-4. It isn't a flying 4-4, so like I'm still willing to run this one sometimes, but it's more like of a C tier kind of willingness as opposed to like a like Angel Angelic Ascension. I'm just like, this is D, if not F tier kind of willingness. Um, but yeah, cyber conversion and reality shift definitely take the cake. So Resculpt has kind of been left by the wayside for me. Yeah, Resculpt really matters like what colors your deck is. The, the, the ability to hit an artifact is, you know, not that big of a deal. Maybe if you are playing in Azorius colors where white can have a bunch of ways to do with artifacts. If you are playing in a Demir deck, I think Resculpt becomes way more powerful because there's not other options to deal with artifacts. So like that utility is, is very, very powerful there. Mm. Um, so th this is this is, and I think we're going to be basically saying this from here on out. A lot of the things that matter are what the colors of your deck is and what the other color or other colors in the deck are able to handle. And in the case of Resculpt, that's what matters. If I'm if I'm playing um, Demir. I, this is a very valued card to me. If I'm not, then something else is going to probably do the job better. Well, let's get into a color we haven't talked about yet, which is weird because we're talking about removal. We haven't talked about red yet. So what do you guys think about Wild Magic Surge? Because that one, I feel like a lot of people were kind of hopeful for. It's uh, two mana, it's red, red for an instant, destroy target permanent opponent controls. Its controller reveals cards from the top of their library until they reveal a permanent card that shares a card type with that permanent. They put that one on the battlefield and the rest on the bottom of the library in a random order. So kind of Chaos Warp, ish but it destroys the target first yeah i i wish it was chaos warp ish but it's a lot more polymorph ish unfortunately the reason this is important for red is because it can indeed hit enchantments which is hard for red to do the mm -hmm. issue is that they're going to get another one <laughs> so like it is actually kind of safer if you are hitting a big creature because then you might be giving them you know just a mana dork for instance but like i've seen people use this on like a marari's wake and then it turned into another like six mana enchantment that was uh, still making the person like well i feel like my position has been a lateral movement rather than a, a, a setback and so for it to cost you a card wild magic surge i also was one of those folks where i was just like yeah oh, i've got high hopes for this it hasn't really panned out in my opinion i've kind of got it down as like a d tier i, I just don't really touch it i i wouldn't call this card a skill test i, I think i would call it a self-control test <laughs> um you know it, it, to to Use Source of Shares for an example. There's not a lot of downside to like wildly pulling the trigger on a Source of Plow Shares on a creature that maybe isn't that big of a threat. Yes, you've wasted this removal spell, but like, okay, who cares? You've removed a thing. If you pull the trigger with a Wild Magic Surge on a thing that isn't absolutely threatening the situation in the game, then you risk putting something much more backbreaking into play. Yeah. So I, I, I think, I mean, I, I don't love cards that are that variable. Um, I think there are probably, again, some color combinations where you have so few options. This is much more attractive, but uh, I don't love the variance or the ability to absolutely get burned by it. Yeah, I, I think that's a very good way to put it is this card is a, a skill check or a, a self-control check because, yeah, but it, uh, so many times I've been in games where, ah, ha, ha, bolt the bird. I'm going to waste a removal spell on a mana dork where people like, th people do that in Commander all the time. I don't know why. <laughs> kill the payoffs. Don't kill the setups. And so people will do that. But then all of a sudden, like, yeah, they're, they're suddenly left without removal for the big scary creatures that they have to get rid of. Like, oh, I, I wasted a removal or an exile spell on something that didn't matter. And now they have an Abyssin in play. Well, poop. Well, Matt, I know that you moved straight to red because that's one of your favorite colors, but I think we got to talk about some two mana black spells because it's one of my favorite colors. Um, there, there's a whole swath of these. I think Gova the Throat is probably one of the most famous, which can kill a, a non-artifact creature, which is certainly better than the typical Doomblade can't kill a, a, you know, it has to hit a non-black creature. Um, and, and so like that one's famous, but nowadays we've also got stuff like Infernal Grasp, kill any creature you lose to life, or Bitter Triumph, a personal new favorite of mine. You can kill a creature and you have to either pay through life or you can discard a card. Um, to pay for that one. And then, of course, there's Feed the Swarm, which probably exists in almost a separate tier to that one, because Feed the Swarm is one of the few black cards that can target an enchantment as well. Sorcery Speed on that one, it's kind of its own grade. I'm like, yeah, B tier, I love that. If I'm playing black, I probably need the ability to get rid of enchantments. But that's kind of a different conversation than the other three. Where do y'all fall with the other three instant uh, black creature removals? 
I mean, Feed the Swarm, I think, kind of has to stay just because, like you said, it's one of the very few black ways to get rid of enchantments. And so you kind of need that around mm -hmm. just because of flexibility. And again, like Dana mentioned, if you're playing a, an Orzov deck, for example, black and white cards in there, you have access to artifact and enchantment removal, so you don't really need it as much. Exactly. Yeah. Go for the throat. I don't remember last time I put it in there just because there are so many powerful artifact creatures these days that you, you need ways to get rid of that. So I want as few limitations on my removal as possible, at least when it comes to, uh, yeah, I'm trying to kill these things. Uh, oh, I have a go for the throat. And there's a warm coil engine that's going to kill me. Yeah, I, I, I'm tr I keep trying to, to contextualize all of this stuff. Black's removal is is interesting because it doesn't have the blue or or white problem where there's a couple of really obviously cards that are so much better than everything else that you would probably run in every deck able to run them. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. That isn't where black is. There's no like one or two standouts. You're like, well, obviously I'm putting this in my black deck. Yeah. Um, there, there's a lot more flexibility here, and I think that's more interesting. Don't get me wrong. I'm not going to like advocate that we remove Swords of Plowshares from the game or anything. But it does make making choices in white less interesting. And that is one of the things I like about this discussion in terms of black. It's almost entirely you making a decision based on what best fits your play style in your deck and your meta. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I actually misspoke earlier as well. It turns out that Go for the Throat is showing up in 120 thousand decks but infernal grasp has superseded it it's showing up in 152 thousand decks so uh good for you infernal grasp and in general i do kind of prefer that but the new bitter triumph is actually kind of like making its way up the ranks for me because that option to discard a card is the kind of thing that black's like all right sweet i tossed an eight drop away and now i can animate dead um or if i need to i'll pay three life and that three life versus the two life of infernal grasp that doesn't feel like a huge make or break to me. Um, I've been really enjoying both of those, but Matt, 100% with you, the lack of restriction is a big deal. And, and I think another important facet about Black's removal too, kind of getting to your point, Dana, is that a lot of Black's best removal is on creatures that it will like whip in and out of the graveyard a whole lot, like the Chupacabras and like Playcrafter kind of effects too. And there are a lot of like Black death triggers that reward you based off of those. We're not talking about creatures in this episode, but that is another thing that sort of complicates Black's removal in that regard as well. So for me, Black's removal is a mix of these instant speed kind of things that matter a lot but also what are the creatures that are doing a whole lot of the damages too um that you are reviving out of the graveyard over and over so th that's sort of an important thing that tampers down how ubiquitous a lot of these can be well so m i think the best way for me to describe black's removal in commander is that it's it's applebee's basically <laughs> it's never great but it's it's pretty consistent it's always going to be five or ten percent apart from the last time you saw it uh Infernal Grasp isn't really that much different from Go for the Throat, which isn't that much different from Hero's Downfall or whatever else you want to talk about. Like, they're all pretty much the same and interchangeable at really any given level. Oh man, Hero's Downfall. Remember that one? Remember when that used to be a staple, you guys? It's it's always it's always a six. It's never a seven, but it's also never a five. It's always a six. <laughs> always the Brad's made that card. I, I think my favorite uh, of these black removal spells is one that we didn't mention. It's also technically not in the two mana slot and that's baleful mastery oh yeah. um three in a black but you can pay one in a black rather than the spell's mana cost and if you do an opponent draws a card um it, it's an exile effect it hits creatures and planeswalkers so you have some some utility there and, and yes it doesn't feel good to give a person a a card but like there's been so many situations when I've given this card to the person that I'm just going to kill next turn or the person that's so far behind that like them drawing a card is largely irrelevant. That card gift that you're giving doesn't really matter that often. And even when it does, it's a two mana exile creature or planeswalker effect at instant speed. I, I it It's my probably favorite of all of these. And I would personally put it at, as, as a a tier. It's it's my number one black targeted removal spell. All right, interesting. My, my my A tier is the bitter triumph, and the rest fall around like uh, B tier. But that, that's interesting to to hear. The the exile. I see why you'd be very attached to that. I like killing things that I can then revive from an opponent's graveyard later, though. <laughs> sure. Yeah. yeah and I, again, I think that's very deck contextually based too. Because yeah, I I look at bitter triumph and I think, well, I, this is dumb. I have to discard card. I don't want to do this. Uh, so it just it's all about how again you build your decks what's alongside of it what's the strategy uh, it, it sounds like a cop out but it really is contextual because again joey thinks this card is an a i'm like c at best <laughs> why? but i think that's good like that, like that's why i think uh, of all of these black is in the most interesting place in terms of, of pinpoint removal because there's so many choices to make based on like how you personally feel about cards and in, in, 
what your deck is like, that kind of thing. Well, and Matt, you talked about situational stuff and kind of nothing's more situational than like the color identity of some of the cards. So like, you know, Assassin's Trophy, you can only play in a Golgari deck, <laughs> Terminate, D-Spark, Vanishing Verse, Dreadbore, a lot of two mana things that can destroy creatures. Some of them are at sorcery speed. Some of them have different restrictions. Like D-Spark can only get something that has a high mana cost. Um, I mean, the, a, a lot of these I feel great about. Like Assassin's Trophy, boom, I love me some Golgari. Um, some of them are exciting. Some of them not so great, but like, uh, yeah, if you're talking about situational stuff, then multicolored two mana spells, there's a whole bunch of them that have a bunch of different restrictions. I think of the bunch you mentioned, the the, the one that I, I would rate an S tier is Assassin's Trophy. Sure. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and the reason I feel that way is because if I'm playing Golgari or have access to Golgari even, I'm running Assassin's Trophy. And I don't think that's true of the rest of these. Not that they're not good, but like I, I look at Terminate or I look at D Spark and like, okay, well, you know, what else can these decks hit? What other things do I have? What are my biggest concerns? I don't ask those questions with Assassin's Trophy. Oh, I'm I have access to green and black. I'm playing it. Yeah, Dan, I, I totally get that. It it I like the cards that are no no fluff, no hassle, whatever, just quick and efficient. So I don't mind Terminate. I know it's kind of been outclassed by a lot of things that have been going on lately. I highly value D-Spark, actually. The fact that you can hit any permanent that has a mana value of four or greater, and it's an exile effect, Yeah, I in my tables at least, I think that very rarely doesn't hit things that are impactful. Um, some, Yeah, if, if you're playing at the CEDH tables, maybe the targets are a little more limited. So I, I totally get why the higher power level you go, maybe D-Spark gets valued less, but at the, the tables that I'm playing that, you know, mid-level, kind of maybe on the lower side at these point in times, D Spark is great. I think it's going to hit pretty much any target you really need to at the tables that I'm playing at. Interesting. I, I think black white removal in particular has a, a much bigger spotlight than any other color combination. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, if not that, then maybe Esper because it also has like the other one mana blue spells that you can use. But like black and white are so good at removal, and there are a, a lot of very versatile like three mana things in these colors too that can do a whole lot of stuff. That like uh, black white removal spells tend to fall a little bit lower to me because I feel like that is such a crowded field. Yeah. And, and then some of the others that operate at sorcery speed like Dreadbore, I'm just like I don't want sorcery speed removal these days. I just really don't <laughs> like it's going to have to do a lot of extra stuff for me to play something sorcery speed nowadays. Joey, if you want to talk about how far the mighty have fallen, yeah. Dreadbore is that card. Like we can joke about Hero's Downfall, used to, how it used to be such a powerful card and now it's getting pretty uncommon. But Dreadbore has fallen even further, I think. It, it, it's the card that you like write your master's thesis around when your subject is the evolution of EDH the last decade or something. Like you, That's a perfect example of a card that once upon a time was very highly... If you were playing Rakdos, I, it's two mana. I can hit creatures or planeswalkers. It's fantastic, even though it's sorcery speed. And today, I, I'm not even considering it for a Rakdos deck. I it, it you got you got to be digging pretty deep. I I would say it's probably C tier still. I know you yeah. both aren't as high, but it's it's C tier and it's kind of slipping. But I I just I don't remember the last time I put it in a deck anymore. Right, <laughs> and and that's just it. Again, it kind of comes to like I, I put it at D tier, but like what's the difference between D tier and C tier and F tier for me? Uh, like if it isn't S A or B, like it's a tough sell to put it because you don't have like 14 slots to devote in your deck to just pinpoint removal spells, especially because you need other stuff like wraths and things that are versatile and, and yada yada. So yeah, th this is really interesting. Matt, you also mentioned a card earlier that kind of got me wanting to talk about some of those uh, removal effects that pin things to the field, mm -hmm. but I think we're going to have to table that for now because we've got something else we got to do first, and that's challenging the stats. It is about that time. It is about that time, yeah. There's a lot of other interesting removal spells to get to, but there's also a lot of interesting data on EDH rec that we don't always agree with, so we'd love to challenge those stats right after a quick break. All right, well, I'll kick us off this week. So I actually have the listener submitted challenge this week. So Eric Cantor sent us an email, which you all can do at edhretcast at gmail.com and had a really good non-bow for a new card that, I mean, it's making waves in competitive formats, but for Commander, this certain combo doesn't really work the way people, I'm sure, think it does. So Eric said in their email, I'd like to challenge us that's on Niv-Mizzet Guild Pact, which is the new five-color niv Miz that we've gotten in Murders at Karlov Manor, where niv -Mizzet, the ability that we're keying in on here is whenever niv Mizzet Guild Packs deals combat damage to a player, it deals X damage to any target, target player draws X cards, and you gain X life, where X is the number of different color pairs among permanents you control that are exactly two colors. So there's a really important line at the end of that ability 
where it says that are exactly two colors. So Eric's email then goes on to say, according to EDHREC, 20% of the NIV decks currently are running Leyline of the Guild Pact. Despite the name synergy, Leyline is anti-synergy with NIV Mizzet Guild Pact, whose combat damage trigger cares about different color combinations among pairs of permanents you control that are exactly two colors. Leyline makes all of your non-land permanents all colors, which means none of your permanents will be eligible to be counted for NIV Mizzet's damage trigger. This is a great great catch. I know that Leyline of the Guild Pact, people are very excited to play this because it's a powerful card. Uh, it's a Leyline that means you can have it on the battlefield if it's in your opening hand. Each non-land permanent you control is all colors, and then lands you control are every basic land type in addition to their other types. So it fixes your mana right off the bat. But it absolutely is an anti-synergy card with niv ability because instead of your two color creatures being two colors, they're now five colors and they don't count. This is an absolutely powerful, powerful card that just doesn't line up. The synergy isn't there. It's one of those non-bows and we love it when our listeners send in these non-bow challenges stats. So first off, Eric, thank you for the email. And also second, thank you for this awesome challenge. This is a great catch and just make sure folks, if you're doing this, take Leyline out of those decks. Really love that. That's terrific. Thank you, Eric. Uh, I'll move on to my challenge now. And y'all, we got to talk about Voya Jaws of the Conclave. Um, <laughs> Voya Jaws of the Conclave is a ridiculous card. Um, this is the new Naya 5-5 Wolf with Vigilance Trample and Ward 3. Uh, and whenever it attacks, you put X plus one counters on each creature you control where X is the number of elves you control and you draw a card for each wolf you control. So since Voya's a wolf itself, it's going to draw you at least one extra card a turn while it's on the field. And it turns all of your elves into permanent like anthem effects. This card is ridiculous. And... Wizards has this really nasty habit of seeing a commander that has a lot of abilities that draw a lot of attention and deciding to give it a ward ability. Wizards, I'm begging you, please stop. Um, but for the purposes of talking about how to make this deck a little bit better if you are playing Voya, 41% of Voya decks right now are playing Cultivate, and I know it sounds weird to say that Cultivate is overplayed in just about any deck, but Cultivate is not really necessary in elf decks, and Voya decks are so full of so many elf mana dorks, it's ridiculous. Priest of Titania, Elvish Arch Druid, Incubation Druid, every one drop elf that's ever been created, Marwyn. There are so many other elves producing so much mana for you already, and those elves wear counters that Voya is pumping up your entire team with, that those are the ramp effects that you'll want to prioritize instead of Cultivate. If Cultivate was really important, you'd think that Kodama's Reach would have a similar level of popularity, but it doesn't, because you don't need three mana ramp effects in this deck. You want the elves, because the elves are going to hit your opponents like a bus. So so yeah, I'm going to call that one overplayed here. If you're playing Voya, there's a whole lot of elves that can wear your counters a lot better, and they'll give you probably even more mana. So that's my challenge. Dana, how about you wrap us up? Uh, my challenge this week here is for Wand of the World Soul. Um, two and a white, it's an artifact. It ETBs tapped, um, but you can tap it for a white mana, and it has a tap ability. The next spell you cast this turn has Convoke. Um, if you go through a list of the top commanders that are running Wand of the World Soul, and it's in about 10,000 decks right now, they are almost exclusively commanders that make tokens. And that makes sense. You're, you're making bodies and you have a, a bunch of them because your, your commander produces tokens when it does a thing. So you have them available to tap to, to cast a spell. Um, where it's overlooked, though, I think, is commanders that give your stuff vigilance. Um, Heliod, the original Heliod, um, Tori, Devant, Fury, Rider. Th there's multiple commanders where your stuff is not going to tap when it attacks. And for whatever reason, people seem to be overlooking Wand of the World Soul in those decks and just Convoke cards in general. I think for whatever reason, people get hung up a little bit on Convoke being a mechanic that is really only something you use in a token deck. And I think people need to remember that if you are playing in, in some kind of a deck where Vigilance is a thing that your creatures frequently have, Convoke is just as good there. So Wand of the World Soul or Convoke in general, just if, if you are playing some kind of a deck where there's a lot of Vigilance going around, that's a really strong card, as is anything with Convoke. Interesting stuff. Yeah, yeah. That's really wise. All right, guys, let's move back into our main topic here, talking about some pinpoint removal that can hit some creature stuff. Uh, before we moved into challenge, Matt, you had earlier mentioned cyber conversion, which is a thing that can flip a creature face down, which kind of gets it stuck on the field. And the instant speed nature of that was why we wanted to talk about it in that uh, earlier section. Mm -hmm. But there are a lot of other cards 
that kind of fit a similar type of bill that also pin creatures to the battlefield, quote unquote, famously stuff like Darksteel Mutation. There are a couple of those folks. Dana, I know you're famous for playing a couple of them. So like sort of as a category, where do we fall with some of those different types of cards, do you think? I mean, I love this category of cards. I, I've been playing Darksteel Mutation since I first got into the format. I'm still playing it. It's one of my favorite cards. It really depends though. So one card that I've... <laughs> I soured on this card super hard. I was very excited for it. Swift Reconfiguration, mm. I thought was going to be A. I thought that was going to be a, an absolute powerhouse. Absolutely has let me down. It is D tier. It's a one-turn fog most of the time. I don't love it, but otherwise this category is absolutely great. It, they're all like B usually. Yeah, yeah Swift Reconfiguration is the one that turns the thing into a vehicle. <laughs> so like it loses creature status. Yeah. And that means it's stuck on the field, but the ability is still there. And that's often the most important thing. So I, I almost think this is better as a protection piece. But in terms of removal, like, yeah, it, it's garbage as removal. But it's actually good to protect your own stuff if you need it to stick around and survive a board wipe. And that's kind of funny. Uh, but I'm with you. Yeah. The, the other stuff is a lot more interesting, like you said. This stuff is really weird. Like, I, I am a big fan of these spells. Um but in low power games, it doesn't feel good casting something at sorcery speed. And they're almost all sorcery speed, you know, Dark Cell Mutation, Lignify, Kendra's Transformation, Song of the Dryads, yeah. um, Imprison in the Moon are, are, are probably the most frequently used uh, of, of this collection of cards. Um, you're casting them all only when you can cast a sorcery. And if you're playing in relatively a low power environment, do you really need to like remove a commander for a long period of time? Like probably not. And if you're playing at a super high power level, well, then you probably can't afford to have your removal be at sorcery speed. But I think there's this mid tier where I actually tend to play at where you see really strong commanders, but like you can also maybe afford to run a few sorcery speed removal spells. And I love these. And in particular, I love being able to, to remove some commanders that like you need to remove for long periods of time. I can't let you play Voya. Like, <laughs> right. Like Ansrag the quake mole, the, the, the new legendary mole God from the murders of Markov manor. I can't let you play that. If like, if you have that in play and attack one time, you're going to win the game. So I, I'm going to hit it with the Arxia mutation and not feel bad about it at all. Well, and, and even more important, I think, so th th there's kind of subcategories in this. So you have cards, like Darksteel Mutation, like Oubliette, that they're either getting rid of the, the creature or just getting off the battlefield completely. But then stuff like Kenrith's Transformation, I'm going to put those a tier below just because it the creature, you can block with it. You can chump block. Mm -hmm. It's going to die. You're going to reset it. It's going to put it back in the command zone mm. to get recast or whatever. So Witness Protection, Lignify, Kenrith's Transformation, those are a little bit below the rest of these categories. But Song of the Dryads and Imprison the Moon are absolutely, for me, a tier because it's so much harder to interact and kill lands. Yeah. Especially it's, I just, I love those cards. Yeah. Anything that takes away the abilities of the creature is vital. And so having it linger around so they can't change zones and recast it. I love this category, but song of the drives and imprison the moon are probably two of my favorites. I think I recall the last time that you put an Imprison in the Moon on, it was my Martin Stromgold, and I was just like, oh, my game is over. <laughs> like, and that was, yeah. But it was also just like, yeah, you probably shouldn't allow me to do Martin Stromgold things. That's totally fair. Yeah. The, the only caveat that I kind of have on Imprison in the Moon is that Blue has so many other really fantastic instant speed stuff that Imprison in the Moon is sometimes a tougher sell. And Song of the Dryads being able to just nuke a creature is very important for Green's capabilities. That is a little bit rarer for Green to like remove that creature from its presence as a creature at all. Um, and that's important. But in general, Matt, yeah. Yeah, cosine on basically everything else you just said, um, especially the fact that you said oubliette, um, which Dana, I noticed that you weren't <laughs> mentioning it yet because you would have said <laughs> obliute. <laughs> now, I see. I, I agree with you, Joey, that blue has a lot of good pinpoint removal that we, we've already gushed about. I think there is a lot of value in being able to tag a commander with imprison in the moon, because if you just destroy it, they can recast the commander or if they you destroy anything and goes to the graveyard, you can reanimate it, locking it down long term. I, there's a lot of value in that. So that's why I still like Imprison the Moon a little bit more than you both do, because I, I think there's a ton of value in not letting them recur a creature. 
And and as a, a quick thing, a thing that I'm and we're not actually going to talk about bounce spells in this episode, but like I'm almost kind of like deviating with tempo a little bit and considering playing more of those like echoing truth style spells to see how powerful bounce can actually be in those moments. Um, so the instant speed things versus the locking down things, that's a, a tempo relationship that I'm still playing around with. And it's interesting to see that we're on slightly different sides of that, but they are fun to continue to explore for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Well, what, what do you say we move on to three mana then? So we, we've talked a lot about cheaper efficient spells. Now we're kind of getting into a crowded field here at three mana where kind of like mana rocks, there's a lot of good spells with upside. Where do we start? I think Chaos Warp is a good one to start with because it's kind of a singular card, particularly in red. There's not really anything else that just solves any problem. Yeah. And Chaos Warp solves any problem. And I, I've seen, you know, people online like, oh, so, you know, you're going to give them something really big. Well, okay. Well, why are you casting it on something that isn't like <laughs> game <laughs> yeah. ending then? Yeah, yeah. Don't don't make bad decisions with Chaos Warp and you can't, it's not going to hurt you. And, and and if someone's swinging a Blightsteel Colossus at you and you Chaos Warp it, do you care what gets flipped off the top? There's nothing worse than losing. There's nothing someone's going to r reveal that's worse than losing the game. <laughs> you know? <laughs> So as long as you're like using the removal when it matters, who cares what it flips off the top? The, the fact that it also gets around indestructibility, like, yeah, yeah this yeah. is A, if not S tier for me, it, just because of Red's restrictions. Like, this is an important staple of the format for dang good reason. This should, like, it's, it's such a popular card. And it's really easy to blank. The, like, the downside of it is really very frequently winds up not being a downside. Yeah, but then you always have... You always have that one time where you flip over the card that you just got rid of. Sure. And it doesn't matter. That you have to start time. over. Yeah. Though that, there's always, everybody has that one Chaos Warp story. And and I agree with both of you. It's it's probably the most valuable red card across all decks in the format. Just because it does things that not, really not any other red card can do. It, yeah, absolutely. Like, it, it's showing up in a third of red decks that are able to play. It's a third of all red decks. It is the second most popular red card in the entire format. Like, th this thing's a staple for an absolute reason. Um, and I kind of feel similarly about Chaos Warp as I do about Beast Within. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Just because, again, green, yep. having the ability to affect creatures, it was not supposed to. This card is a color break and a half. And that one's showing up in 42% of decks that are eligible to play it. Destroy any permanent, give its controller a 3-3 Beast. I, I feel like, to me, the most interesting discussion it starts to approach here when we talk. Like, we all know Beast Within is good. If you're playing green, you're playing Beast Within. We know that. But an interesting discussion ha starts to happen when we compare Beast Within to Generous Gift, which is the white version. And to me, Generous Gift is not nearly as good as Beast Within because of the stuff that white can already do. And uh, I I'm kind of curious where, where y'all fall on that. But like, I feel a very specific way about Beast Within that I don't about Generous Gift. So I, I would argue that, yes, Beast Within is probably the, the, the green version of Chaos Warp. It's a card that it's doing things that the, the color just doesn't get to do most of the time. Right. Generous Gift, I... I don't think that all the power is lost on Generous Gift because we've already talked about all the hyper-efficient ways that white deals with creatures with Swords of Plowshares and everything. But the fact that Generous Gift and Stroke of Midnight, I'm, I'm going to lump together here, mm. they're so flexible in their targets is where they're really you know, letting you shine. Mm -hmm. You have that flexibility. I think there's a ton of value there. Now, Generous Gift, a little bit more flexible than Stroke of Midnight, but still, I, I think that the, at least, and we've talked about this before, to me, the size of the creature you're giving them does make a, a decent bit of difference. It, it does, but I, I will note this. There was a, a couple of years ago, a, a very skilled pro player made a comment in an article about Beast Within and Commander and how it's perhaps overplayed because of the 3-3. Um, and I will kind of, def that, that person got dragged a little bit for that comment. And, and I will defend them by saying, this is someone coming from an environment where people are good at magic um, <laughs> and, and like and, and, and I, I'm, I'm joking with that but like if you're playing in a real if you're playing in a competitive format and someone beast ends your thing you're going to put a token in play and like it's going to be there whereas i guarantee every one of us have gotten something hit with a beast within and just because the games went quickly you've grabbed a six-sided dice and put it down with like the three pips up and then forgotten what it was for four turns. Wow. Like that's happened. And that's not something that's going to happen if you're playing modern or whatever. So th the reality is the creature that you give people with some of these effects in commander, because you're just goofing around and there's four players and there's a lot going on. It's way less impactful than it is elsewhere. In part, because folks just forget it's there sometimes. <laughs> Wow. I mean, if, if you're using an infinite token, I guess you're not going to forget quite as easily. So, there we so, go. That solves the problem. Everyone using infinite tokens. Yeah. So props to infinite tokens for just helping everybody remember what those dice mean. But I, I do agree that 
blockers in general are a little overrated when it comes to translating from modern legacy, all that. Yeah. Point being on all these cards, they're all great because they're solving so many different questions that you have about a, any given game. And I would say the, the the same thing I talked about, like Assassin's Trophy. When I'm building a new deck and I fire up Architect and start putting my 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 entries in for it, if I'm playing green, I'm probably throwing Beast Within in that list. If I'm playing red, I'm throwing in Chaos Warp. If I'm playing white, Generous Gift at the very least are in my first draft, and they are probably surviving all the way through. So, so Dana, when you brew up your decks on Architect, do you ha just have like your removal packages ready to go, and it's just all of these cards we've talked about? For the most part, I just know off the top of my head and throw them in there. And, and you know, we talked about uh, just on last week's show about like cards that don't have homes and like trying to find ways to make decks more interesting by running cards that you know maybe don't see play elsewhere. I like to do that, but I don't think anyone's ever been like, wow, that removal spell you ran that I never heard of was really cool. That's not <laughs> something for the most part that like anybody gives you respect for running something weird and obscure for. So like I, I usually don't worry about it there. I'm just running the things that best fit my deck. And th those cards I just mentioned all kind of fit that criteria. Okay, so uh, I, I know that we've just heaped a bunch of praise onto Generous Gift, but like I, I'm, I'm going to say I prefer Stroke of Midnight, and I think Generous Gift is making its way out of my decks a lot more these wow. days. Wow. So, so Joey, I remember when we first talked about this, you said, I don't know, Generous Gift being able to hit lands is too important. I, that was not me. That was that Dana. Stroke of Midnight. That was not me. That, okay, that was Dana. Yeah. I, I remember you two were still high on Generous Gift, and I said, I actually think Stroke of Midnight, the 1-1 one, one versus 3-3, three, three isn't irrelevant. I guess for me, truly what it's kind of come down to is that like, I can't remember the last time that I used a generous, a generous gift on a land anyway. <laughs> it's like yeah. kind of yeah. like, so like, so if I'm not using it on lands and I've already got like ghost quarters and stuff in my decks that will help out with any of those problem lands. And I've got so many other cards that white is already using that like, then why bother giving us something that is slightly, slightly bigger? Um, so, so yeah, it's just, it, it's fine. But like three mana in removal is actually starting to be a bit of a tall order. Yeah. Like we yeah. also got a shout out Excise the Imperfect here, which exiles a non-land and gives them an incubate token with counters equal to the mana value of whatever you got rid of. I was high on this one initially, but I've gotten kind of disenamored by it. Like even though the opponent has to pay mana to flip that token onto the creature side, if I hit something important with this three mana spell, then that creature that gets left over is actually meaningfully powerful. Like, it carries equipment well. Uh, I've even played against decks that take advantage of the fact that it's an artifact token or that take advantage of all the counters that it's wearing. Plus, the two white pips on this one make it, like, a slightly harder splash. So even though that one exiles, I still en end up ultimately erring on the side of Gift and Stroke, and I ultimately fall just slightly more towards Stroke because I usually end up using these types of cards not on lands. I've got other stuff for that. Uh, but I end up using these types of cards on big creatures, big artifacts, big enchantments. And in those moments, I find myself more pleased when the setback feels more pronounced, I guess. I mean, that, that is an important point. I think it's also kind of power level dependent is how much targeted land removal do you need? Are you just playing like a ghost quarter in a, in a wasteland and something like that and calling it good? Or do you feel like you need the generous gift? And, and I know, Dana, you really value being able to blow up lands. Most of the time in games that I'm playing... Very rarely is there ever a land that like, okay, we have to blow that up. I think in, in most of the games that I've played at lo local game shops, stuff like that, it's just not all that common. So I just, yeah, maybe just our experiences again and, and our play groups are kind of defining our opinions on generous gift versus stroke of midnight. Yeah, I, I think very much so. This is the, this one very much comes down to like personal preference. And for me, I, I, I'm not, you don't get to play with Nick Thos. Yeah. You don't get, yeah. To, play, you know, you get to play with Cabal Coffers. I don't think so. But like for some folks, it's not that big of a deal. And I, if it isn't, I, I understand the logic behind like the 3-3 three, three versus the 1-1 for you. If you either don't see those or aren't that worried about them and what they do. Yeah, I get it. There's also, and, and this is like a later section we'll get to, but there are certain other types of removal spells coming out in this color that can hit something per opponent rather than just mm -hmm. one thing. Yeah. And that's also in this uh, type of mana slot is a thing that I'm starting to pay a lot more attention to as well. So that's why these particular slots get pretty awkward. Um, as an example of that, for instance, Grasp of Fate. That's a really famous sort of Oblivion Ring style effect that can temporarily shut something down from an opponent's side. And if they can kill the enchantment, then that stuff can come back. Um, like Grasp of Fate, though, it can hit one thing per opponent and i'm starting to value uh, cards like that a, a bit more lately yeah, yeah. i don't value regular oblivion ring i think that one's garbage compared to grasp of fate like that's f tier <laughs> in terms of like compared to what grasp of fate can do because it can hit everybody and it gives you that option um 
But anyway, I've been talking about that for a while. Where do y'all fall on a thing like Grasp of Faith that can hit everybody? I, I will say I, I've come around in Grasp of Faith. I didn't like it at first, but I think that was me misplaying it um, mm. because I, I, when it first came out, I'm like, oh, th- this is really good value. I can hit three targets for you know the, the three mana. That's excellent. And I put it in multiple decks. And what I was doing was playing it and like hitting three threats. And what wound up happening was that meant there were three players that felt incentivized to remove it. So it just didn't stick around and keep threats gone. Mm-hmm. And so I quit using it. But th- I, that was a mistake on my part. I think the way that you use Grasp of Fate is to hit a problem and then just hit a couple pieces that the other players can't rationalize removing it to get back. So you take out like someone's you know talisman or t- something like that. <laughs> that you're like, oh, it's gone, but no one's going to bowl or move to get back their talisman, especially when it frees up that other person's Archangel Avacyn or something. Um, so, so I, I like this more than I once did because I just was playing it poorly at first. Yeah, I, Dana, I'm very glad that you had that experience because that's kind of what directed me to. I've always loved Grasp of Fate. <laughs> yes, you can hit three high value targets, but then you have three people trying to get rid of it. Whereas even just like the person who might have counter spells, let them also protect that because, yeah. okay, we've united. We, we agree that the Grasp of Fate being on the battlefield is solving more problems than it being gone and letting that person have... Uh, whatever is monstrous going to kill us all next turn. That is absolutely a, a bunch of play that Grasp of Fate brings to the game that I, I love it. I love it so much. And it's just a good card. I, I think, like Joey said, anything that hits something for each opponent, high value for me, A tier for Grasp of Fate. Sure, yeah. I think it's great. But I, I do agree. Most of the Oblivion Ring effects, stuff like that, D tier a majority of the time. There's a couple others I consider now and then. But I, for the most part, I, I don't love it. I don't like them. In a similar vein, Council's Judgment is a voting card. So same cost, two, and two, two white and a colorless. And you vote. Uh, and the permanent that has the mo- the permanent you don't control with the most votes or tied for the most votes gets exiled. Um, it's almost always going to hit the biggest problem in play. Oftentimes you can deal with two problems. Sometimes you can deal with three problems. It just depends on, you know, how what the board state looks like. I... I think I like this card more than its value, maybe. You know, like I, I, I think <laughs> sure. there are things that are better that I could run in the decks where I run it, but I, I, I think it's a fun and interesting card. So this is one where I don't always go with a peak optimization because it, it just always makes for a good time when I cast it. I so I'm fully like I, I I my initial instincts when we put this down I had like some initial like instinctual grades that I put down it was just like oh CT or this or whatever grasp of fate and council's judgment are both things that I'm just like no I need to reevaluate and especially council's judgment which like this actually technically kind of goes against our rules because we said we were like it has to be able to target a creature the thing about council's judgment is it doesn't it doesn't actually target it, it's true so it can get through stuff like hexproof or ward so like i am actually kind of personally wondering how much i modify the removal that i'm using these days to try and get around to the fact that wizards keeps slapping ward two and ward three on just about every creature that they think (laughs) is powerful and needs to be defended from removal so like stuff like these are moving upward and upward in my estimation if my instinct was a c i think i actually need to move these into a b for for example um because uh, like having that that reapproach of like how we engage with removal seems pretty important in a world where wizards is playing around so fast and loose with the types of defense that commanders have yeah i mean council's judgment always has been a, a fun card it's kind of slipped a little bit just because again sorcery speed three mana there's a lot it's it's a very slow card and you need kind of you need options around there yeah otherwise it's always going to be just a, a, a three mana hit one thing so but it does i i agree dana it does bring a lot of fun things to the social aspect of games and it, it's fun to watch this just kind of create some chaos it's also a card that gets better if you actually take a little bit of time to explain what's going to happen, um, because most <laughs> people don't see it, and they it, it's kind of difficult to like math out what's going to happen mm-hmm. ahead of time, particularly if they haven't, if they've never had it come into play before. Whereas if you take a second and say, "Hey, Council of Judgment," and I'm picking this, and then if you just pass the vote, <laughs> then who knows what will happen? But if you point out. If you pick this and this person is going to pick this, and if you just take like 20 seconds to like lay out what might occur, it becomes much, much better because people tend to then go along with it as long as you're not being ridiculous. Whereas if you just like throw it to the wind, who knows what might happen? <laughs> it's really interesting to see how many of the like interesting three mana cards occupy the spot in white. And I know that there are going to be some, like, 
you know, there's also the hero's downfall and the murders out there in other colors, but like right. they they stop being real interesting or real real fast. And there are a whole bunch of them that we're probably not going to get to. And I think it's actually probably more interesting for us to discuss some of the stuff that moves into multicolor because that's where we get a lot of other things that are I don't know, kind of kind of juicy. <laughs> like there are some cards that have really fallen from grace as well. Y'all were talking about how Dreadboard did it. I think Vindicate is one of the bigger masters of like, oh, how the mighty have fallen because that card used to be like the card you played in black white yeah and then anguish on making kind of came and just totally supplanted that throne v vindicate and dreadbore are hanging around at the old folks home right now like yeah. really pumped that it's meatloaf night tonight <laughs> wow and that's and, and that's it that that's where they're at for the most part see i i don't hate vindicate anymore like it's still it's so such a flexible card there's no downside there's no losing life there's no giving your opponents anything i i don't hate vindicate but you are right that anguished on making is just it's so efficient. It's hitting so many different things, uh, and in at instant speed, which is yeah. a huge value. So I, I still think that it's like A and B for me. Like anguish and making still is a A level card. Vindicate is B just because oh, wow. it is sorcery speed, but you still have all the flexibility there. Oh wow, I, I'd put Vindicate down at D. I, I can't remember the last time I've ever played it. Yeah, I, I don't play it anymore. And honestly, I I think the final nail in that coffin was Stroke of Midnight. Sure, sure. Um, I, I'm just not gonna run it when I have access to that. That's not gonna. It's gonna always work. It's gonna be at instant speed. Sure. Uh, yeah. It's and and then there's too many effects to run. So. Again, it's one of those situations. I don't think Vindicate's a bad card necessarily. I don't disagree with anything Matt said about how effective it is. It's just not good enough to make the cut when there's so much competition. And I feel a little bit differently about Vindicate than I do about like Maelstrom Pulse. Like Maelstrom Pulse is also a sorcery speed removal, but like if you use it on a token, it destroys everything that shares the name. Yep. So you yep. can actually wipe out tokens with that. And I've got respect for the detention sphere effect for some pretty similar reasons on that too. But like in general, like sorcery speed is such a tough sell for me nowadays. And I, even then I'm like, oh, I have respect for Maelstrom Pulse, but I don't play it. <laughs> um, but, but it's like a great hire, but truly what does that mean in the grand scheme of things? Yeah, the 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 hitting multiple things with with Maelstrom Pulse uh, um, and Detention Sphere to a degree too is relevant. I think in a meta context, when I first started playing Commander, I played against the same like three or four people every week, and one of those people just played token decks. So Maelstrom Pulse was a really valuable card to me because it dealt with this one player's token swarm every single time. Um, so in that context, you know some of these things we we talked about how. Depending on what you're doing, some cards are better than others. Like in that environment, it was an amazing card. Um, whereas, like, I don't think there's many situations where you're like, oh, in this one unique meta, Oblivion Ring is really good or something. Whereas, uh, some of them, I think it's worth noting that Maelstrom Pulse, if you're playing in a certain environment, might still be a star. Defen Detention Sphere in a certain environment might might still be really, really good. Yeah, I still really like being able to take out whole armies. Yeah, so Maelstrom Pulse, <laughs> Detention Sphere. I I like them both. Um, I, I mean, I would even argue that Pernicious Deed kind of falls in this category too, where like, I mean, granted, I know that kind of gets into board wipe territory there, Yeah. but there's still a lot of use for these. And if you need those in your deck, I don't think anybody's ever going to side eye you for playing a lot of these cards here. Yeah. And and that's actually also, I'm never going to side eye is very much my mantra when it comes to like the mortifies and the putrefies of the world. Yeah. Um, because they're budget friendly. Yeah. yeah. Like, so I've got them at like kind of C tier. I don't play them because I do have access to stuff like Anguish on Making that I do think are superior. Um, just that flexibility is really important. But like, they're, they're what, 12 cents? So like, yeah, go off. Absolutely play them if you want to. Um, but in terms of upgrading, I think they fall out pretty quick. But they're a really nice, easy way to make sure that your deck is going to do what a deck needs to do. So I've got respect for them, even if I upgrade out of them. Yeah, I, and but to me, that's kind of what C tier really is, is the cards that... They, they're cheap, they're going to get the job done, but they're also, yes, there are better options, but also C tier, I'm never going to look at you like, oh my gosh, why are you playing Council's Judgment? Because it absolutely does get the job done. Or, or Dreadbore, I see why you would play it. It's just, again, you can do better. I'd side eye a Dreadbore, yeah. Yeah, I think that's a, a nice a nice metric. And there are a lot of other, even more ridiculously, like, multicolored spells. Like, I don't know, if we go into three color, you've got Voidrend, which can get around Ward, because it can't be countered, and that's very nice. So I respect, I respect that. But also, like, if you're an Esper, you, you already know. It's just like, oh, okay, cool. Like, you can only play this in, in certain types of decks. Um, the last kind of interesting one here, I think, is probably Bedevil, which is the Rakdos one, which has a really specific pip requirement, which is why I don't really care for it, but I wonder how you guys feel. I mean, it's really hard to cast, yeah. And that's where it loses me a little bit. I also, I have played Bedevil and it never really seemed to come up a whole lot. And maybe it's because 
my my playgroups typically don't play a ton of planeswalkers so it's just kind of lost there but right but devil just kind of seems i mean i to me it's the same as mortifying putrefy it's a multicolored removal spell that has some little extra flexibility but it's never like great either yeah i i, th- I think the the little bit of extra utility you get on it over say a terminate or something isn't probably worth the 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 three mana cost or the 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 pip requirement on it as well. Right. Um. It, it's it's a it's a it just quite it just misses just a little bit in a in a couple of different ways. It's the hero's downfall of Rakdos removal spells. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Truly. And that pip requirement is just like it, it's second tough. Okay. There are also though a lot of other spells that deviate even higher in the mana cost that I think are important for us to get to before the show ends. So Matt, do you want to move us into some stuff that costs like four mana and above? Because that's a whole big discussion of whether it's worth it to play stuff that costs a lot of mana to get a creature. Because um, four mana is wrath territory, you know? So yeah. like, how do we feel about that as we move into higher cost removal spells? I mean, so I'll start off with one that I will defend till, I mean, not quite my dying day, but I'll defend uh pretty adamantly is Asterian's Thirst. Uh, yeah. So that's a four mana <laughs> four mana removal spell. And I know we talked a lot about black at, at the two and three mana value, but four is where you kind of get a lot of fun spells. It's kind of like the five mana wrath territory where you can get some modular wraths that sometimes are, you know, one sided or something like that. And there's just a lot of play with these. And so Asterian's Thirst is four mana exile target creature. So you have the exile right there, but also you put X plus one plus one counters on a commander creature you control where X is the power of the creature exiled this way. If you have a deck that likes your commander to be big, Asterian's Thirst is wild. It's so stinking good. And and yes, four mana, you have to have your commander out there. You could be playing Deadly Rollick. There's there's a lot of argument for what you want. Do you want hyper efficiency or do you want the upside there? And I love the upside here. Yeah, I I feel like once you get into the four mana removal territory, I think almost all of the ones I would run are super situational. Like an Asterian's Thirst, where I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm playing in black. I'm you know, it's a Voltron deck based around plus one counters. It's a no brainer. Well, you know, like the, 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 but outside of that really narrow window, I'm probably not playing it. So, it so makes Skullbriar good. <laughs> yeah. So like these tend to be the cards that are super focused and it becomes really difficult to give them a, 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 a solid rating here because the decks where they're amazing, they feel super good and they're fun and they're interesting. Right. And everywhere else, they're just not playable almost. Yeah, Mortality Spear, you play it in a black-green life gain deck. And aside yeah, yeah. from that, you don't. It's very, very much that feeling. Um, I'm kind of curious how you guys feel about Price of Fame, though. That that one, that one I've got a, a love-hate relationship with. It's a four-mana spell, but it costs two mana if you are targeting a legendary creature with it. It destroys the creature, and you surveil two. Um, I can say I don't play it, but I like it. <laughs> um, it's kind of like commander-only removal. But I don't know. Have, have y'all actually experimented with this one? I mean, with how powerful commander creatures have gotten lately, I understand why you're running it. I also, I wouldn't be super excited for it. Yeah. I mean, it, like, again, I, I want my removal to be as open-ended as possible. I want to, I want to maximize the flexibility and, bail, and Baleful Mastery, Price of Fame, stuff like that. It doesn't really do that. So I... It, I lose a little bit on price of fame just because paying four mana for a, a kill spell is that's a lot. Yeah, like is it only two mana to hit a legendary creature? Sure. Or I could just run any of the number of two mana remove creature spells in black and right. have it always yeah. work. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and the surveil two doesn't feel like it offsets that to me. No, no. Um, that, that's where it gets. Me. M- m- yeah. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm with you. And that's what how I feel about certain things like uh, Death Sprout, Binding of the Old Gods. I guess I have a lot of affinity for Golgari. Sorry about it. Um, but like, yeah, four mana to kill just a creature starts. I'm just like, well, I could have played a, a board wipe. <laughs> like a board wipes are at four mana. Um, and so like it just feels harder and harder. And especially because of, you know, how much board there is. Now they're going to be six mana to actually play some of these. It gets really hard to justify playing a, a whole bunch of them nowadays. And I've kind of felt that way about Utter End for a while which is the, the Orzov one that can exile anything, but it's four mana, and I... Yeah, I just don't like it, because I just... I Four mana is so much to pay! See, see I would ra- I would 1,000% rather play Utter End and get all that flexibility and know that no matter what, I'm always going to pay four mana versus a price of fame where I'm hoping to, to pay two mana, then I'm mad about paying four mana. The expectations are so different there, but also, Hagra Mauling is just always... It's four mana. <laughs> Nobody, the, the Hagra Mauling, where it, it has the ability of this spell costs one less to cast. If an opponent controls no basic lands, 
the only person that's going to ever affect is Dana. Everybody <laughs> right. else plays basics. <laughs> right. right. This yeah. Hagra Mauling will always be four mana. Oh man, and that's so Hagra Mauling is so interesting because that's the one that could be a land on the on the backside, but it's a tapped land. It's better. It's more valuable to you as a land. I'm telling you right now. But it's tapped, and the tempo hit on this on both of those. That, that's that's how bad the front side is, Joey. <laughs> oh, my word. Yeah, I I've also like oh Hagra. I feel like it could. Ooh, is there? And, and uh, every time it just can't. Like, it's not. Yeah, and I play a lot of bounce lands, and even then I'm still like I there's I I can I know I can do better. Like I, I can find other other lands that will offer me I think more utility than this option would. I know a lot of people are really high on playing as many of the. MDFC lands that could be spells on the on the front half. I know a lot of people really enjoy them, but this one has Matt. I'm fully with you. I I don't like playing this one. Yeah, those those people just didn't learn their lesson. So <laughs> don't don't play Hagra Mauling. It's just I, that's like the first like hard F for me that we've talked about. Just really don't play Hagra Mauling. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh wow. Okay, interesting. Like I I see I can see corner cases for a majority of the other cards that we've talked about, like Death Sprout stuff like that. I I can see the rationality there. So like. It's a, a D tier card for me, but Hagra Mauling, it's just the worst version of any of these cards that we've talked about. And it's so limited. You only get to destroy a creature. There's no exile. There's no flexibility. Get out of here with Hagra Mauling. I, I'm not going to get it an F, but I'm not going to run it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I've, I've been eyeing building a new Izoni deck, and I'm just like, ooh, a four mana thing. I could collect evidence for, but like, even then I'm just like, do I just need land that I can fetch? <laughs> so <laughs> Now, one I probably will run is Terra Sunder. Um, yeah, yeah. It, it's it's one in a green exile target artifact or enchantment, and if you kick it for one in a black, um, exile target non land permanent. Um, and I think the reason I'm really cool with Terra Sunder, despite you know being a four mana removal spell, is an exile for one in a green on an artifact or enchantment is a pretty solid rate of return that I would consider if that's all the card did. Mm. I, I'm a big fan of Exile. It solves a lot of problems. It you know, deals with Indestructible. It makes it difficult to recur things. That is almost playable just there alone, let alone the fact that I can turn it into an in, in utter end-ish uh, you know, ish deal with any problem for four. Yeah. So I, I am a fan of Terra Sunder for sure. Yeah, I, I like Terra Sunder a whole lot. Just for all the reasons you said, Dana, it's, it's super, super flexible you're always going to have something to hit with it no matter when you draw it. Well, and, and to compare to Hagar Mauling, like, because Hagar Mauling is kind of a modular card. You have to choose between it being a land or a removal spell. And, and I found what you want from a modular card is you want either one of the two effects to be so good that you don't care about the other one, or you want them both to be equally valuable. Otherwise, you're overpaying for an effect that you're never going to use. In Terra Sunder falls under the category of I'm perfectly fine with paying both of those costs. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it, it doesn't feel like you're missing out on some, yeah, that's a, a really great way to phrase it. Where, whereas Hagar Mong, you kind of feel bad about paying both of them. Yeah. <laughs> you kind of feel yeah. bad about the yeah. removal and you kind of feel bad about the land coming into play tapped. Uh, where are you guys at with some of those multi-targeted things in multicolor? Uh, like Wind Grace's Judgment, Decimate. I mean, I know where I fall. I, I don't like Wind Grace's Judgment, even though I really thought that I would, I, that five mana is so much, even if it gets one thing per, per player. Um, but Decimate, I, I feel like I'm always happy when I see it. Decimate, yeah, they're, they're, they're going to hit a lot of different targets, which is nice. Wind Grace's Judgment also, I, I, it fell short of expectations. I think a lot of folks were very hopeful on it. Yeah. Uh, I still really like Curtain's Call. Oh. I think that's still a card that I, I wish I could find room for more because it really does. Granted, the Undaunted is kind of the hard part about it. Yeah, usually it's going to be three mana. Sometimes it's going to be four, but it does hit any two creatures. I, I, I do appreciate Curtain's Call. It's one of those that is like kind of tough to find a slot for. I'm totally with you, Matt, especially because I mentioned earlier with black decks, I like to have creatures that are doing a lot of the work because I can sacrifice those and that will have extra benefits that ripple out through the rest of the deck. But man, Curtain's Call is just high key a favorite removal spell, even despite that. Yeah. So when I can justify playing it, I really love to. These are so tricky. Um, you know, uh, I don't think any of them are bad. And I've currently have Wind Grace's Judgment in a deck. Um, and it's fine, and I never really feel bad about seeing it, but I also never feel like this is really, really good in this deck either, despite the fact that it hits multiple things. You know, I've ran Decimate before and kind of had the same feeling, like, when I cast it, oh, that was really effective. But it never feels, like, super clutch necessarily either. Sure, um, sure. Because of the mana value, so these are just really tough. I I, I think they're, they're the kind of cards that I oftentimes put in a deck, and then when I start cutting down to try to get that architect list down to 100, 
Hmm. These are the ones that wind up like I'm lo- I'm looking at when Grace of Judgment, I'm looking at Assassin's Trophy and Terra Sunder, and I'm like, well, when Grace of Judgment's gonna uh, of the three is going. So I pull that out and like yeah. it just never quite seems to make it compared to the things around it. Dana, is it you who plays Lethal Scheme? The four mana black instant with convoke and each convoked creature connives. Uh, I have never done that. No, I've never cast it. Okay, well then never mind. We don't have to talk about it. I guess we don't love it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, ooh, this looks like it could be useful in a token deck, but like, uh, I don't think so. Uh, an interesting part about removal for me is like, I want my removal to be useful even when I'm far behind. Yes. A lot of removal spells, especially at this mana slot, kind of like pivot themselves or, or position themselves into a point where like these are good to press an advantage, and I do like removal spells that like can press an advantage advantage but also ones that can like get me out of a really tough scrape and and, Mm -hmm. uh, so that's kind of how i feel about overwhelming remorse actually which i thought i was going to love it's a five mana removal spell that exiles a creature but it's cheaper to cast if you have a lot of stuff in your graveyard and i'm just like yeah no people people are too wise and also like i I usually get all the stuff out of my graveyard anyway so like that one i was so disappointed with how ineffectual it ended up being um and it just like kind of has to do with is removal good when you're already doing well versus does it help you get out of a bad scrap um and that's just kind of a, a lesson to learn i think about these high mana cost removal spells yep i i agree yeah there, there's potential there but i don't know I, I feel like we've also mentioned so many cards that we're, we're kind of scraping at this point <laughs> the, the, there's one last one i'll say that has it's very very new it just came out in the murders at karlov commander stuff um and that's unexplained absence which kind of going back to like the discussion about gender gift and stuff J- unexplained absence is kind of i think i might be pivoting more towards this one lately uh which is the four mana white instance for each player exile up to one target non-land permanent they control for each permanent exile this way its controller cloaks the top card of the library so they get a face down two two kind of a reality shift for each person and like the fact that this can hit any type of permanent i want to start paying a lot more attention to this one four mana to hit four that you can even get your own thing if you need a, an emergency blocker like this one is really catching my attention in terms of recent developments and uh, yeah i gotta keep my eye on it i i see why i see why it's appealing but also you're you're giving them something that can be turned face up it has ward which kind of i i'm not i'm not a super i'm fa- not targeting a face down two two anytime soon with a removal but, but you're but you're so. giving them a, a face down suspected thing and, and that's where i'm just kind of like i don't know about that it's kind, of, it's kind of like Declaration in Stone. Like there's there's potential there, but I'm I'm not super excited for it. I, I could see myself liking this card. I could see myself not liking it, but I think it's so there's so many things going on and so many variables that I'm I I have, I have a tough time evaluating it yet um, until I see it in play multiple times. So I, I'm I'm withholding my judgment on it because I, I it's there's just so many like divergent different like trees it, it, it's it's a multiverse of a card and I, I i can't in my head visualize how it's going to work i have to see it in play well dana by the time this episode comes out we'll have just spent a lovely time in chicago playing magic against each other and i've got this in a couple decks so hopefully i'll get to uh make an impression there we with will. It yep. when we play um and hopefully it's a good impression i plan on whooping your butt with all of my awesome removal spells <laughs> um do, do we have any final thoughts uh when it comes to removal or or any of these things that we have ranked like are there any final impressions that you kind of want to leave with do you think i think that there's a lot of removal out there there's some you should be playing and some like hagra mauling that you should not be playing so (laughs) customize away is this going to be your new bully pulpit of, of just like, oh, Matt was anti-Turgrid. You thought he was anti-Turgrid? No, Hagra Mauling's really the... No, because the... Turgrid goes in the command zone. This is more like my monologue tax of, of removal yeah, spells. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's fair. I think the last impression I'd like to leave is just like, with more ward coming out there, I am starting to consider how much I'm going to modify removal uh, that, that I play. Like, will I play more stuff? We didn't talk about like stuff that forces high, like big creature sacrifices, like soul shatters, but those are other things that like, oh, those can get around ward too. Um, ward T-O-O. <laughs> not ward the number two um and the, like those are kind of things that like as ward is becoming more popular as these types of defensive uh, legendary creatures are becoming more popular i'm considering how i'll change my my stuff up and so dana maybe i'll be uh, copying you and playing more council's judgment as well those are things that i'm paying attention to when it comes to removal and i think we do need to reevaluate it and rank it uh, more critically more often to figure out how to yeah. navigate a changing commander metagame yeah i i think that's a really good way to look at it um i, I think just be flexible when you're evaluating these cards like number don't dismiss a card because it sees a lot of play. Um, you know, everyone plays Farts of Pulse Shares. Well, yeah, because it's a ridiculously good card. Um, <laughs> on the other hand, like once you get down past those first couple spells, you don't, don't give in too much to what everyone says is good too. Like 
evaluate what's going to work best for you and don't be afraid to run that Asterion's thirst if your deck really is going to take advantage of the things it does. Yeah. Yeah, uh, really, really well done. All right, guys, that's been a whole lot. And listeners, we'd love to hear how you rank some of these removal spells. What are your favorites that we didn't even get to mention in this episode? But we got to call this episode to a close. So if our listeners want to get in touch with us, where is it that they can find us on the onlines? Matt? So you can find me online, pretty much any social media platform, at Mathemus55. That's M-A-T-H-I-M-U-S-5-5. And don't forget, we are proud to have been part of team ultimate guard now they make the best deck accessories out there best sleeves best deck boxes so make sure you pick some of those up as well and dana how about you you can find me online at dana roach i'm running articles for edia track and commanders herald and you can find all of us together at patreon.com slash edia trackcast and i'm joey schultz you can find me at joseph m schultz online most likely being a fool on instagram and if you want you can contact us at edia trackcast online or edia trackcast at gmail.com if you'd like to send us an email maybe a challenge the stats our thanks go out once again to Chase for their fantastic work in the post-production of the show. You can find them online at Mana Curves. And listeners, we'll be back at you next week with more data and insights. But until then, remember, EDH wreck your deck before you wreck your deck. Mm-hmm.